Uh, Ryan, thank you uh, for being with us today. Uh, I, I, I know we are all very frustrated to not have you uh, on stage uh, with us in, uh, in, in, in Monaco. Um, but we hope to, uh, to see you uh, coming in the, in the coming years. Maybe you want to, to quickly introduce yourself to the, to the audience uh, today. So you have a, a large, uh, large crowd from uh, uh, the biggest organization, uh, both uh, public and private in, in France. Uh, big uh, uh, audience of uh, IT professional and, uh, and cyber security experts. Do you mind uh, quickly introducing yourself? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, I will just tell you before I start, <clears throat> I think that if you're disappointed that I'm not in Monaco, I'm much more disappointed that I'm not in Monaco right now. So uh, one of my favorite cities, I hope that everybody enjoys themselves while they're there. But uh, my name is Orion Hindawi. I uh, co-founded Tanium about 13 years ago. Uh, I'm the CEO here now. Uh, I have uh, spent most of my time here in Tanium really focused on the technology and building that for our customers and working with customers on getting it deployed in some of the largest organizations in the world. And so uh, given that I can't be there in person, uh, this is the second best and I appreciate the chance. Thank you, Orion. So uh, I, I will start by this. So we have been uh, living an interesting uh, uh, six, nine months with, uh, with COVID-19 now, and uh, everyone is calling it uh, when the world stayed at home. And most of the companies that are in the room today have put their employees from work to home, and it created multiple challenges, VPN saturation, lost asset visibility, and patch vulnerabilities. And most people are live through this or are living through this. So. If you can give us your, your own perspective on how this will evolve in the, in the next 12 to 18 months from a, a technology point of view. Yeah, I can say, you know, I talk to a lot of the CEOs and CIOs of our customers on a regular basis, and it's amazing how quickly people have adapted. Uh, and it's also amazing how many people think that this adaptation is going to continue. So uh, what I mean by that is that many of our customers have people who are working from home and uh, I think in most cases they plan to have the office reopen in some capacity, uh, but many people are going to continue working from home the majority of the time for many customers. Uh, I think that a lot of customers uh, have gotten used to the idea that their data, even their customer data, uh, has to be accessible to people at home. And so that data is flowing in ways that it hadn't in the past. Uh, I think that many of our customers have gotten used to the idea that their network control has gone way down uh, and that they, in spite of that, have to provide the same level or better security than they did before. Uh, and I think that in many cases, uh, and we talk to customers like this all the time, hundreds of thousands of computers went home, hundreds of thousands of monitors and sometimes printers and all kinds of assets went home. And in a funny way, asset management, knowing what you have and where it is and what it's doing, is even more critical today because I think the risk of loss is higher, both of data and of the assets themselves. And so, you know, if we look at what's going to happen over the next 12 or 18 months, I think a lot of the investment that customers have made to get used to this new world uh, is going to have to continue being made because I don't think that we're going to just snap back to the old way of doing business in almost every company we talk to. And I will tell you, I think that we are seeing more attacks than we'd seen in the past. Uh, I think we're seeing more risk of loss. Uh, I think that there are many people who are taking advantage of this situation, as ugly as that is, to cause even more damage. And uh, I think that our customers are right now working in a, a slightly disadvantaged environment, a new world. They have to keep a standard of excellence that's as high or higher. Uh, and we, as their partners, need to really invest with them to get them comfortable there. <clears throat> so if we are saying that uh, working from home uh, or working from anywhere is a new norm, and that it comes at the same time where basically most organizations are facing huge cyber pressure. So how do you, how do you think it will shape or it will impact uh, our industry in, in the future? So if we look at the cybersecurity industry, and I think I'm saying something that everybody who's in your audience already knows, uh, there are too many vendors. Many of them do very small things. 
and the amount of time we as a vendor community spend marketing to you instead of building products for you, I think is out of whack. I think that uh, what a lot of our customers are realizing is they just don't have time to process through the 2000 vendors who want their time. They have to pick a few vendors they trust, really invest with them in building capability and through that process, get to a place where they have more definable, consistent control. I think there's going to be a huge shakeout in our industry. And I think it's been a long time coming. I think that as an industry, it's been so well funded and customers have had the ability to spend time with the vendor community to such an extent that it's overgrown. And I think we've all been waiting for a while now for it to reduce. But I think that this transition of the last year is going to accelerate that simplification of the vendor community into platforms that people can really trust. If we go back to the, to, to the very beginning, uh, Orion, uh, 13 years ago, you, you, you co-founded uh, uh, Tanium. What was your original vision of, of, of Tanium? Sure. So to, to really understand that, I think you have to understand where we came from. So uh, about now 23 years ago, we co-founded a company called Big Fix. And Big Fix was a platform for Endpoint that let customers see what they owned. And in about 2007, 2006, we started having customers coming to us, telling us that they needed more than we could give them. They needed us to give them Instead of days old data, they needed seconds old data. Uh, instead of doing it at scales of tens of thousands of assets, they had hundreds of thousands and they saw themselves going to millions of assets. And so we started Tanium around the idea that customers needed a fundamentally stronger endpoint platform, more flexible, more scalable, more real time. If they wanted to be able to deal with the challenges of growth, and of change that were coming at them then. So this is in 2007 when mobility was just starting, virtualization was just starting, cloud was in its very infant stage. All these things were starting and I think our customers saw that these things were coming and that they were gonna drive requirements that they get better at manageability and at visibility and at control. So we started Tanium as an experiment around being able to get data instead of in days and seconds, instead of on tens of thousands of machines, potentially on tens of millions of machines, and to be flexible enough that the next use case and the next use case, instead of requiring a completely different tool, could just be put on top of that platform. And we spent five years building that new platform because it turns out that if you wanna do things in seconds instead of days, you need to do things thousands of times faster than they were done in the past. And that typically doesn't happen if all you do is take the old approach and do it a little better. That typically happens when you throw the old approach away and start over, and that takes time. But with the investment of time, I think we were able to build a communications architecture that is so fundamentally different than what people are used to that it allows people to do things they really didn't imagine were possible before. And we now have customers who have millions and millions of assets in one system and can ask arbitrary questions of those assets and get data back in seconds that they trust, be able to change those assets. And what we're finding is that's very relevant in compliance and in patch management and in asset inventorying and software distribution and application mapping and integrity monitoring and all these use cases. But really at its fundamental core, for the first time with Tanium at large scale, people actually can see what they have, where it is and what it's doing. And I, I think we were able to accomplish that because we had heard from our customers at Big Fix what they really wanted. And we were able to take the time to really process it and come up with a novel solution instead of kind of rewarm what the industry had done before. So that's an interesting point because if we, if we, if we go back uh, seven years before the, the, the creation of, of, of Tanium, uh, Les Assis uh, were funded and launched in the, in the French market, so 20 years ago. And actually, they are celebrating their 20 years anniversary this year. 
And at the beginning, it was really uh, a small set of, uh, of, uh, of vendors. And now it's growing exponentially. I think uh, uh, this year we will be close to 200 vendors joining this, uh, this edition. And it's becoming really hard for the CISO to continue to innovate in that environment, uh, whilst continue to protect their organization. So how do you see that, that vendor landscape uh, evolving in the coming years? And yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, so I was talking to one of our customers recently, and she was telling me that her biggest concern today is that she has 30 different tools on her endpoint. Each one of them have a communications architecture. Each one of them is typically running as local system or root on the devices. Uh, each one of them can make changes on the devices. And her biggest concern at this point from a security standpoint is that one of the vendors will give her attackers access to her environment because of bugs in their platform. And that was a pretty amazing statement because if you really think about it, having 50 or 30 different ways to get to your endpoint and make root level changes on that endpoint is terrifying. I think the reality of our market is that it has to go the same direction that workflow or data or networking have gone in the last 10, 15 years. So you look at what ServiceNow has been able to do for workflow, taking a lot of different little vendors and consolidating it into a platform. You look at Splunk or Elastic or somebody like that for data. You look at Palo Alto or Cisco for networking. Endpoint is still a fragmented mess. And so when you look at our market, I think that our customers are realizing that they're spending too much money. They're not getting the efficacy that they need. And they're actually introducing potential vulnerability into their environment by having all these parallel systems. And the reason that people are selecting Tanium, and at this point, we have the majority of the Fortune 100, the whole US Department of Defense, a lot of these really huge managed networks, a lot of the networks that are in France and in the EU as well, the largest networks in the world. And the reason they're doing it is they can't keep fragmenting the endpoint anymore. You may have features coming from some of these products, but in the end of the day, the efficacy and the risk of the organization are not helped by having 20 or 30 or 50 vendors. And so in our space, I think we're going to see consolidation. And I think it's true in a lot of other spaces too. You know, when I look at what Microsoft is doing on endpoint protection, they're taking that market. They're doing the best job by far. And we're seeing it in a lot of our customers where Defender is doing an amazing job first party in the operating system protecting them. But I think manageability, the ability to see what you have, where it is and what it's doing and be able to get the ability to change that when you need to is something that a lot of people have not had effectively. And if you have it, then you can leverage those features of those other products and you can have confidence that it's working. And in the process, you can simplify your environment and make it way more secure because you don't have these 50 or 20 or 30 parallel communications that can change your environment or potentially expose you to risk. So we have another question from, from, from the audience today. Uh, we had multiple discussion with, uh, with some CISO and, and, and cybersecurity professional that are attending les ACI this year. Basically what they are saying is the following. Uh, cybersecurity uh, is more and more, more and more a board item agenda and some of them are struggling to be able to represent the work and everything the cyber organization in, in a company is doing to a, in a language and that a, a, a board is able to, to understand it. So I know you have, you have done the same with your own Tanium board. What, what do you think would help the CISO or what will be uh, able to help them to uh, explain the cybersecurity and all of the work that is behind to, to a board, to a board level? So, you know, we present to boards of our customers a lot. And funny enough, in COVID, when Zoom is the way to do it, I've been doing it even more because you travel less, you have access to more boards, and they really are worried about this today. And 
there are two things that jump out at me when I'm presenting to these boards. The first one is a lot of boards, if you look at the background of the people there, they're politicians and lawyers and businessmen and you know financiers, but they're not technologists in many cases. You may have a few people on the board who really understand technology, but a lot of people don't. And yet they realize that this is an existential threat to the company. So, you know, a board's real responsibility is to protect the company from the things that can destroy the company. And this is one of those things where at the same time, it exposes the company to extreme risk and they just don't understand it. And so what we spend a lot of time doing is explaining to boards how attacks actually affect companies. So you look at the companies in the last year who've been able to uh, get out of some of the bad breaches that have happened to them. The pain that they suffered in the process of getting out of those sometimes are extreme. If you look at ransomware, you look at some of the attacks that have succeeded in bringing down manufacturing capabilities in stealing super critical data and exposing it. They want to understand how these attacks actually happening or happen. And then they want to be able to understand how do they mitigate the risk to the business from that attack succeeding? Because they're already in a place in many cases where they realize that attacks are going to succeed. And the question is, how do we mitigate the risk that those attacks are going to cause existential damage to the company? So, you know, we spend time talking to them about segmentation and what that really means. We spend time talking to them about zero trust and what that really means. We talk to them about hygiene, and this is probably the, the subject that probably resonates the most with boards that we present to. Most people in the boardroom understand the concept of keeping the place clean. So in IT and in security, that means things like making sure patches are deployed, making sure that you have all of the critical infrastructure that you need working on the endpoint, actually running and updated, making sure that you know where every asset is and where your critical data is, what users are there, knowing what the landscape looks like and then being able to fix it when you see deviations so that at least the non-creative attacks will not succeed. And, and I will tell you, and this is something we tell boards all the time, and I think it's something that Verizon and other people who study this have confirmed over and over again, the vast majority of attacks that succeed are not the Russians coming in through the skylights with zero day vulnerabilities that are really interesting. It's known vulnerabilities that are years old in many cases that are being exploited because people just didn't close the doors and windows. They didn't close the known vulnerabilities that we've known about sometimes for years, but because the systems weren't working or because we were gonna get to it tomorrow and then we were gonna get to it tomorrow, they were left open and that's how attackers often cause the most damage. And what we need to communicate to boards more than anything else, I think, at least in our opinion, is it's going to happen. There's nobody in this world who has a network that's of size that's not going to suffer from attack at some point. The goal is to make it as difficult as possible for the attacker to limit the damage that's caused when a successful attack occurs and to make it so that when an attack is occurring, we can get there as quickly as possible and stop it. And I've had this conversation many times with boards. I know that many of the people in the audience have probably had it with their board, maybe other boards. The good news is for every conversation you or I are having, they're having a lot of conversations with each other right now. And I'm also presenting to things like Business Roundtable where you get a lot of CEOs together. They want to understand this. The boards as their training board members want to understand this. And I think the level of understanding is going up. And I think it's because of a lot of the people in this room but it's also because they are educating each other and I think they're educating each other in a way that's very beneficial to the conversation. Thank you, Ryan. So I think it's uh, unfortunately already time to, to close out, but uh, I have one, one final question for you is, what would be your, your message to, uh, to the audience as we are embarking now for, for the plans for 2021 and, and beyond? I think that our industry would love to show you shiny things, cool, shiny things. And I think that we last year or two years ago, were in a position where everybody's budgets were up and to the right. We had a lot of time for shiny things. 
What I would encourage the audience to consider is that this is wartime. It's not peacetime. For many companies, it's wartime. Their budgets and expenses that they're spending on cyber are a huge issue for them. Uh, and they want to be able to bring it under control. And I think that we owe our companies that we work with and the ecosystem at large to be very disciplined about what we're doing and really find ways to simplify and at the same time get value. And I look forward to the chance to be able to work with these companies to do that. I think there are other vendors who are doing it uh, and I'm excited to see that go forward. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you. Um, hopefully we'll have the pleasure to host you uh, on stage uh, in the coming years. Uh, in Les Assises at, uh, at, at Monaco. So, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a hard sell for me. I'd be very happy to come to Monaco anytime. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a pleasure, guys. And I hope it's the rest of the conference is good. Thank you, Orion. Thank you very much.